So let me just give you a taste of some of our initiatives and then focus on two. Uh, the two that I will focus on is the Immigrant Justice Corps and the New York uh, Immigrant uh, Family Unity Project. So one, one foundational study group initiative is the New York Immigrant Representation Study, which I'll discuss more in, 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 in a moment. It's basically uh, an effort to get the data and to use the data to figure out how to think intelligently about um, solutions. So we'll talk more about that in a moment. And we'll also talk in a moment more about the Immigrant uh, Justice Corps, uh, which is uh, an idea that I have that would enable uh, young college graduates like yourselves and lawyers, as well as senior lawyers of retirement age, to provide pro bono legal services uh, to immigrants. Other initiatives which I'll talk about very briefly, we've partnered with bar organizations to recruit uh, pro bono lawyers. We've established uh, fellowship projects with Human Rights First and the lawyers from Human Rights First work to train lawyers in firms to undertake pro bono activities. Uh, uh, we devised programs for deferred associates at a time when uh, law firms were laying off lawyers. We would train these lawyers for immigration activities. Um, we've um, also uh, worked to uh, create immigration law clinics, uh, an example being the Catherine O. Greenberg uh, Clinic at the Cardozo uh, Law School. We've, we, we, we've uh, worked with uh, uh, Attorney General uh, Holder and Senator uh, Schumer uh, and others, um, and, and with great thanks to them, um, uh, in New York, uh, for the first time, a legal orientation program was created through which nonprofit providers, the uh, Legal Aid Society in particular, advise immigrants and groups individually of their options when they're facing deportation, so that if you're facing deportation, you have a place to go where you can get some advice. We've, enjoy, we've uh, joined with state, local, and federal government uh, officials to examine how consumer law can be used to attack the problems of fraudulent legal services. We've worked with the American Immigration Lawyers Association, sponsoring two days of intensive training in immigration law for non-immigration lawyers who want to help. We've also uh, recognized the substantial unmet needs of uh, non-citizens upstate, where you have a lot of workers uh, uh, working on farms, working in migrant uh, activities. And there, upstate, the need for uh, legal support is even greater than here in New York, where at least you've got a substantial legal community. We've supported the work of the Albany Law School and the Prisoners Legal Services of New York in their joint project to offer representation at the Ulster New York Immigration Court. It's a great project and I had great uh, pleasure of, uh, of, of, of visiting them not too long ago. And as uh, President Travis indicated, we've organized uh, major conferences, uh, one at Fordham and one at uh, Cardozo uh, with Justice Stevens focus uh, as our, our guest uh, speaker at, um, at, 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 uh, at, at Cardozo. So now let me give you a, an in-depth sense of two of these projects. Um, I want to first focus on the New York Immigrant Representation Study and then the Immigrant Justice Corps. First, the uh, New York Immigrant Representation Study. Anecdotally, it's very clear to anybody who's a judge or who's a lawyer that if you don't have a good lawyer, things aren't gonna work out um, too well. Um, but as a, a, as a great uh, mentor of uh, mine, Senator Moynihan uh, used to say, you're entitled to your own opinion but not to your own facts. So uh, in that spirit, I believe that it was very, it was imperative that as a, one of the first things that we needed to do was to um, undertake a uh, serious research study looking at the uh, extent of, of, of the immigration representation 
problem uh, and how and using and from there thinking about what the solutions might be. We created the uh, New York Immigrant Representation Study with funding from the uh, Leon Levy Foundation and the Governance Institute. And that was chaired by Peter Markowitz, uh, uh, Stacy Kaplow, and, and Claudia Slavinsky. Incidentally, I could go on for an hour mentioning everybody who has been so essential to this, this project uh, from the very beginning of this whole study group. And in my printed remarks, I mention, um, I hope, just uh, all of them. We issued, as President Travis said, with respect to the New York Immigrant uh, Representation Study, two reports. And just to reiterate some of the, the data that uh, President Travis uh, indicated, because it really highlights the need and our efforts to uh, meet the need. 60% of immigrants who were detained during the pendency of the, their deportation proceedings do not have counsel by the time their cases are completed. 27% of immigrants who are not detained during the pendency of their deportation proceedings do not have counsel by the time their cases are completed. The data also showed that when we first started the study, uh, undertook the study, that the transfer policies of the Department of Homeland Se Security created significant obstacles for immigrants facing removal to obtain counsel. Almost two-thirds of those detained in New York were transferred to um, far-off uh, detention centers, most notably in Louisiana and Texas. And you can see the problem right away. If you're transferred, uh, you lose your lawyer. If you lose your lawyer, you're in much, much more difficult um, shape. 79% of those who were transferred did not have representation. Now this practice, I think, in part because of the, the, the findings of this study, uh, has largely been curtailed by the Department of, of Homeland um, Security. The two most important variables affecting the ability to secure a, a successful outcome in a case, and by that I mean either getting relief or termination of the deportation case, are having representation and being free from representation, and the absence of either factor, uh, being detained but represented, or being unrepresented but not detained, decreases the su success rate dramatically. When neither factor is present, the rate of successful outcomes decreases even more substantially. So, um, as, as, as President Travis was saying, if a person is represented and released or, ne or, or never detained, 74% have successful outcome. Think about that. If you have a lawyer and you've not been detained, 74% have successful outcomes. People who are unrepresented but released or never detained have successful outcomes in only 13% uh, of the cases. People who are represented but detained have successful outcomes 18% of the time. And at the bottom of the range, people who do not have attorneys and who are detained are only successful 3% of the time. So having a good lawyer obviously makes a big difference. We also, uh, with the cooperation of the uh, uh, de Department of, of Justice, um, were able to uh, undertake a, a survey of the immigration judges as to their views of the competence of the lawyers before them in immigration court. And the results were extraordinary in the most depressing of ways. Essentially, what the survey showed was that the immigration judges rated nearly half of all legal represent, representatives as inadequate in terms of overall, of overall uh, performance. And so what the study showed in sum that the two major obstacles that we had to overcome um, was, uh, what, what was one, a lack of funding for adequate counsel and a lack of uh, resources to build a qualified core of experienced lawyers who could provide deportation uh, defense. 
So with that data, the next stage was trying to do something with that data, trying to create something that would be a viable enterprise. And so in November of, of, of 2012, we released our report on how to implement a system of uh, immigrant representation in New York City. And the charge of the study steering committee, which was, all, which was interdisciplinary, much like the approach taken by John Jay in this extraordinary sem semester, was to um, come up with a sensible blueprint um, whereby a small group of competitively selected providers would deliver public defender type services to indigent detainees facing de deportation. And we had certain principles that guided this project, whose purpose is to provide universal representation for those uh, facing deportation in New York City. One, provide universal representation with screening only for income eligibility. So this means that the project would serve only indigent clients who cannot afford to hire attorneys. Be implemented through existing institutional providers to minimize administrative complexities. We wanted to communicate that we weren't in the business of trying to supplant the wonderful entities already in place, but to build capacity. Working in cooperation with key institutional actors, such as the Department of Homeland Security and the immigration court system. Include basic legal support services, such as translation and interpretation services, social work, and mental health services. Derive funding primarily or significantly, ultimately, from a reliable public funding uh, stream. I'll come back to that in a second. And be overseen by a coordinating organization that can provide centralized oversight and project management. So those are the principles that guide what uh, we call the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project. And um, the idea is to provide representation for 2,750 New Yorkers each year who face deportation from their homes, from their families. We estimate that, uh, uh, of course, you can do anything with numbers, I realize, but uh, our project would increase the likelihood of, of keeping those New York families together by as much as 1,000% and provide a roadmap for how communities like New York can lead the, the nation. And so um, with all this in mind, we, we brought together the relevant actors and in an historic commitment of, of, of government action, the very first time that a, uh, a, a local government has funded uh, immigrant legal services involving uh, direct uh, counseling. The City Council of New York on uh, June 5th of uh, 2013 announced funding of a pilot project for the New York uh, Family Unity Project. As I said, the, fir the nation's first assigned council system for immigrants, the New York City uh, Council speaker, uh, uh, Christine Quinn, was, was, uh, was very uh, important in that, in that effort. Um, the final stage that is the project of the pilot project, uh, or I should really say the first stage, the first stage of the pilot project itself was launched just a month ago on November 6th. Uh, the pilot is, is based in the Varick Street Immigration Court in New York City, which is the immigration court for, for non-citizens who are detained during the cor course of their removal proceedings. The pilot is, is administered by the Vera Institute of Justice. Legal services for the pilot are provided by an entity now known as the New York Immigrant Defenders which is a consortium consisting of attorneys and support staff from the Bronx Defenders and Brooklyn Defender Services, two very well-regarded defender organizations. And this consortium is working with other groups such as Immigration Equality and the Central American Legal Assistance Group. The hope is that in the coming year, we will be able to secure full funding beyond the pilot stage and that um, this project, uh, will serve as a model, as I say, not just for New York, but, but for the nation. 
The second major initiative is the Immigrant Justice Corps. I'm very excited about this initiative. Uh, this initiative, I think, is, 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 is especially apt uh, in this audience because what we hope to do is to tap into uh, the combination of young college graduates, uh, young and newly minted lawyers, and senior lawyers looking for, for new challenges. So as you know, at this moment, over 500,000 non-citizens and their children are living in poverty in New York. Although immigrants uh, face the equivalent of, uh, of exile, uh, most of them don't have, have as I've said, uh, counsel. So um, what we're trying to do in this uh, Immigrant Justice Corps is, is to create uh, this, this group of people, this cadre of people who will join together in a very important way to help address this gap in legal representation. If there is immigration reform tomorrow, you might think, well, then we won't need as many lawyers. Not so. If we have immigration reform tomorrow, you're going to need more lawyers because everybody who might be eligible for relief will need good advice. And so whether we have immigration reform or not, the need for this Immigrant Justice Corps will be all the more necessary in the years, in, in the years ahead. So um, I propose this core, believing that now is the time to seize the moment, to unite in common cause across the generations, recently minted and senior lawyers, and as, as President Travis said, building upon the model of uh, the Peace Corps, uh, VISTA, Teach for America, the Skadden Fellowships, the Lyman programs. And so this is how this project will, we think will work in the, in the first year of its pilot uh, entity. It will provide 25 of the most talented and promising young lawyers each year with three-year fellowships, providing a wide range of legal services for poor immigrants. It will provide 15 talented college graduates each year with two-year fellowships, which they will, in which they will serve as immigrant community advocates. These legal fellows and community advocates will be trained intensively in boot camps of intensive courses on immigration law with the aid of nonprofits and law school clinics. They will then be placed in clusters uh, with some of the city's uh, uh, lead, leading legal services and community-based um, um, organizations. The project would be funded largely initially through philanthropy, ultimately a mix of philanthropy and, and government support. The uh, uh, project will, uh, we think, be launched in January. We've been working very closely with the Robin Hood Foundation, which has been very supportive of our efforts, and I must say that uh, it's been very exciting to work with, with, uh, with Robin Hood in this effort. So ultimately, what we think that we will have over uh, three years, we will have served uh, some 15,500 cases, uh, ranging from asylum, naturalization, to deportation, at uh, a savings of some 60% uh, in terms of legal services. What we hope to do with this core is to create a new generation of, of lawyers who are committed to immigrant justice at a time when we need to change the way the bar thinks about these issues. There are many terrific immigration lawyers, but as I've said, all too many lawyers who are not very good at all. Uh, many cases that I would see are cases where the lawyer would look at the, the brief uh, and just change the name. And, and would do nothing in terms of changing the arguments in the brief. It would be the same from one brief to another. It was like manufactured uh, lawyering. And sometimes the names would be uh, wrong even. Uh, and so these kinds of shoddy practices have to come to an end. And by having this generation of dedicated uh, young lawyers, you're going to change the, 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 the bar. You're also going to create a generation of, 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 of policy analysts, 
lawyers who go into, and young college graduates who may go into the government, nonprofit organizations, with the experience that they've had in the Immigrant Justice Corps. You're also going to have senior lawyers, people who are nearing retirement, who have a lot of energy, who have things they want to do, contributions still to be made, and they also will be working together. And I just love the image of uh, in a room, the college graduate, the newly minted lawyer, and the senior lawyer uh, all working together in, on behalf of, 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 uh, of the non-citizens. And I believe that this kind of experience will have a lasting impact, even for those lawyers after the fellowships who go into firms. They will become leaders in their firms, trying to get their firms to undertake more pro bono activities. Just as the lawyers, young lawyers in the civil rights movement in the 60s, who are now in firms, uh, they have become leaders for various issues of, of social justice. So um, these two initiatives, which uh, I've, 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 uh, I've mentioned, are just examples of what we, we hope to do. So in sum, the challenges posed by the immigrant representation crisis are many, but so too are the opportunities and the solutions. What I hope that we will all do is, is work together and, and, and join together in the search for solutions. That you are here today is, is testament to your dedication to addressing this crisis and representation. I commend you for all of your efforts and know that many in need will benefit from the fruits of your work in the years to come. And it's, it's a privilege to stand before you and, and uh, see you, all of you here. And, and uh, I hope that we will uh, find ways to keep in touch. So thank you. Many undocumented immigrants are being targeted in different types of communities. They're being stopped unjustly. Um, what would this new project do for those type of immigrants when they go into detention centers, even though they were unjustly stopped by um, DHS um, officials? What, what the project would do um, most generally is um, it, it would provide more lawyers who would be ready and available to work with uh, non-citizens in that, in that circumstance. So whereas the non-citizen who can't afford a lawyer has a real problem, in this circumstance, uh, the, the non-citizen would have access through legal providers that would be uh, monitoring what happens in detention centers and would be available to be of assistance to uh, those in that circumstance. Thank you. Is anything being done to change the deportation laws? You know, I hear that, oh, there's so many deportations. Well, what is the law with regard to deportation? I mean, is it being followed? Deportation, the number of deportations is, is really a function of the exercise of discretion by the, the, the executive branch of government. It's a function of, of the uh, number of prosecutions brought by the uh, Department of Homeland Security working with the Department of Justice. Um, there is nothing in, in law that uh, requires a certain number of people to be deported each year, but the data show that the number of those being deported have increased. Prosecutions have increased uh, over, the, over the years. So um, it's really a matter of, of the executive branch's discretion, uh, and that, that really much determines our policy. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gary Wright. I'm a uh, adjunct faculty here at John Jay. Um, I was wondering if the Immigrant Justice Corps um, 
were you planning also to try and focus on the actual issues that actually occur prior to someone actually getting into immigration court? In other words, most times people actually end up in immigration courts because of bad, very, very bad pleas that they took in a criminal proceeding somewhere before. And that's really oftentimes is the driving factor. And I understand that, of course, a plea bargain is crucial for the survival of most criminal courts, for example, in, in New York. Uh, but someone, say, for example, taking a plea with an assumption that I'm going to receive two-year uh, probation, and that's it. And by the time they leave Rikers, there's DHS waiting for them. Um, I know, of course, that there's need for competent uh, immigration attorneys and also, of course, uh, addressing the issues in, in immigration court. But are you planning also to address you know, those factors that actually drive the cases more, most of the time? That would be the kind of issue that a, a lawyer um, would examine in the context of a immigration court proceeding. What happened before, what happened in the plea bargain, that would be something that any good lawyer would be looking at in the effort to assist the non-citizen who is uh, in immigration uh, uh, proceedings. So yes, that would be something to be uh, uh, considered. And under the Supreme Court's decision in Padilla, which is a decision written by uh, Justice Stevens, that kind of inquiry is something that one can expect to happen more often than it has in the, in the past. Um, there have been other recent decisions that have suggested that Padilla is not retroactive, as you know, but with respect to post-Padilla, I think the kind of inquiry that you're talking about is part and parcel of what a good lawyer uh, uh, will do. And you touch upon something that's important, and that is the intersection between immigration law and criminal law. You have lawyers representing people who happen to be uh, non-citizens in a criminal context, and they may not be knowledgeable about immigration law. What we need to do is to, to marry the two, criminal, criminal law, criminal justice, and immigration law, so that the advice of counsel can be as reasoned and as thoughtful, as intelligent as the non-citizen truly deserves. Okay, um, so um, one issue with immigrant access to justice, I know, is the disparate um, records for different immigration <coughs> judges on the same type of a case. Um, so is that an issue that that the IG or that your working group has looked into? The immigrant justice, the immigrant justice core itself. I don't think we'll be concerned so much with that, <clears throat> but that certainly is an issue that uh, is, 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 is well known. And uh, their data, track data from Syracuse, which clearly show the uh, disparity. Uh, if you are in New York, <laughs> you're in much, your chances are much better than if you're in Texas. And um, uh, that's a fact. And, and it's something that we should all be cognizant of. Hi, um, my name is Stephanie. I'm actually an immigration lawyer. And one of the things you keep mentioning is that there's not enough representation for those who end up in deportation. One of my biggest issues was finding a way to provide pro bono services for those in deportation. Um, I work with a couple of nonprofit organizations. And by the time they get to me, they're already out. What I have found was that it was nearly impossible to get to those that are in the deportation process when I had the luxury of having enough time <laughs> um, to provide services to those who I felt needed it. Um, do you have any suggestions for an attorney whose workload is not busy yet, but is connected <laughs> to enough organizations where she can get um, experienced individuals to advise her to like reach out to those? So in other words, a lawyer, an immigration lawyer who wants to do more pro bono work and exactly. deportation proceedings. Yes, uh, um, just one suggestion would be to contact the, uh, to contact Peter Markowitz at the Cardozo Law Clinic and um, he will, I'm sure, 
put you in touch with uh, any number of providers with cases that would fit fit your uh, your timeline. Peter Markowitz, M A R K O W I T Z, <coughs> at Cardozo Law School, the, the, the Greenberg Clinic. Um, one thing that's really striking about this project is the ability to bring together the executive branch and uh, the defender community and the courts. Uh, are there lessons to be learned from that of how to bring together often adversary interests to advance, to improve the justice and the working of the system in that way? That's a, uh, it's great, it's a great question. Um, I think that the, uh, the lesson is that it takes time to build uh, trust. And to the extent that you look at the various actors and, and not think of them as, as having uh, motives, bad motives, but think of them as having a role. Um, and if you can show them how um, the fair and effective administration of justice can be improved, I think that they will be receptive to it. So, for example, if you can show the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice that having a lawyer, a good lawyer, makes their lives easier, and it does. It makes their lives easier. Then they're more likely to say, okay, let's see how we can work together on this, on this, on this project. And uh, they've been very cooperative in, this, in, the, in the Family Unity Project. But I think the key is trying to figure out what's the commonality of interest? What is this, the self-interest of each entity? Uh, and how c you can harness that self-interest in the service of the common interest? Yes. Good evening. Oh. I just want to take your, uh, your opinion. I'm doing a paper on uh, privatization of uh, prisons. And it seems like to, uh, to me that uh, the more deportations grow as uh, the business of private prisons also grows. So obviously as an, as an immigrant, when you're detained, you don't get no rights. So how can the attorneys actually help if they have no entry into it? That, that's, a, uh, that's a great question. There was a a very fine series by Sam Dolnick of, of the New York Times a few years ago <coughs> on that very issue. Um, when you're talking about private prisons, and I don't want to say more than I know, what is important for anybody in prison, whether it be in private or public, that uh, the liberty interests of the individual in that prison be protected and be safeguarded and that due process be safeguarded. Um, and uh, private, private uh, prisons is a, is a, is a uh, substantial industry uh, and it's a subject worthy of your, your attention. Uh, I think the, uh, 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 there have been hearings that have been held, you might look at that, congressional hearings that have been held on that subject, and there have been a series of reports that have highlighted the, the, the problem in, in private prisons. Uh, so it's, it's what, what, what course are you doing the paper for? Public administration class. I'd love to read it after you. Please send it to me. I, I want to learn more about it, so. Yeah, good evening. Uh, you use the term good lawyer quite frequently. I, was, I wanted to know what makes immigration law so complex that there are so few good lawyers in your standpoint? I think, I think that what makes it complex is that there's so many rules and regulations that have uh, evolved over the years. Um, and just the complexity of the rules and the exceptions, um, so much legislation, so many rules make it, make it very complicated, and the intersection of the criminal law 
and immigration law uh, adds a further dimension to the, to the complexity. So it's not something where you can just, with respect to deportation representation, where you can just uh, wake up one morning and say, I want to take on this case, and I, I can know this. I, I want to help. You actually have to learn it. Um, there are a whole range of different kinds of cases. For example, there are cases involving naturalization, <coughs> which are not that complicated. There are cases involving asylum, which can be complicated, but um, don't involve the criminal law. And then there are the cases involving deportation, which involve criminal deportation aspects, criminal law de aspects, and immigration law aspects. And I think it's, it's the mix that adds to the complexity of it, of it all. Um, it sounds like you're saying, you know, if there's a human being who could be on American territory in a very dire, scary situation for that human <coughs> being, if they had a good lawyer, a good lawyer could really change that future. Like if, whether it's someone in a privatized <coughs> prison or someone in deportation or, is that what you're saying? Is, is yes, yes, I am saying that um, <coughs> a good lawyer can help save a life in the way that uh, a good doctor can save a life. And uh, uh, good lawyering makes, makes all the difference. Hi, good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Mirna Velasquez, and perhaps my question is somehow naive. Uh, I work for a member of Congress, and quite often we receive many requests from people that they want letter of support from our offices based on their humanitarian grounds. I understand that we have to abide by law, but many times this all comes after they have been, I mean, their case has been messed up by unscrupulous attorneys. So I'm wondering what is the weight that these letters have because uh, we understand sometimes that these folks have, uh, let's say, U.S. children or they have medical uh, concerns, I mean, problems that they might be considered on, considered on their humanitarian grounds. So. I would like to know if uh, those letters have some consideration by the U.S. courts. Thanks. I think that uh, letters from uh, legislators that are not simply boilerplate letters, uh, but show a real understanding of the particular case, uh, have to be helpful um, because the legislative branch is critical to the um, maintenance of the executive branch, and where there is a thoughtful uh, uh, letter or inquiry, I think that can make a difference. You know, I don't know what, how it, I can't say it, it changes the outcome necessarily, but what it does is it makes sure that that individual case will be treated very, very seriously. Yeah, uh, in regards to deportation, some have argued that uh, President Obama should just uh, bypass, you know, the laws and just use the executive order he has or executive decision he has. What is your opinion on that? My opinion is that as a judge, I can't really answer that question because I could get a case. I could get a case involving that issue, so. Good question, though. What, what, what do you think? <laughs> Judge Kaspin, I just want to add something that um, people may not know because I also interned as an attorney who went to immigration court quite often. And one of the things that fascinated me and him was the question of, admit, of admit, admittance. And we actually got off a client um, based because the BIA agreed with my boss's briefs that he was admitted. The problem was that he came through the, he landed in Mexico, came through with a, um, came through with a coyote, they call them, and then he, he took a greyhound mm -hmm. from Laredo into New York City so when the question of AOS, adjustment of status, came on, he, he really didn't have a stamp to show 
that he was admitted, but we had collected all the evidence. The, he stayed at a homeless shelter, the Greyhound tickets, the Greyhound tax. And BIA agreed with him that he was admitted and he got his green card through AOS. So In interesting. We just wanted to know that. I don't know if the question of admittance still comes up before you. But Sometimes it does. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, so. there's, let's take two more questions <coughs> and then let's not forget that we have a small reception planned outside so you can definitely continue the conversation with the judge outside. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm a new lawyer, I graduated last year and I was doing post-conviction work for one year and now I'm doing some criminal defense work and I'm very interested in doing immigration law and I've been trying to do a lot of volunteering around with different events to try to get experience and try to learn it. But as you said, it's incredibly dense and complicated. And I was wondering if you had any advice for how I could pursue kind of like this boot camp style training or get like really good hands-on training and experience so that I could like take the leap into providing those services. Again, I would, I would suggest um, uh, contacting um, Peter Markowitz of our group um, at Cardozo Law School. And I think he's, he's got a, uh, he runs the uh, immigration clinic at Cardozo. And um, uh, I think he would prov provide you with a kind of access to information that you need. Thank you. Um, just wondering, do you have a story at hand, and you might not, of one case of someone who was helped by a lawyer in your group? Yes, we have, you know, uh, many cases where um, someone was about to be uh, deported and having the lawyer uh, and gathering the evidence and the, and the uh, data and making the legal arguments led to the immigration court um, deciding that uh, this person should be granted um, asylum. Um, and I think that having a good lawyer, it means all the world of difference in this case. So I think the dreamers in this audience know about the need for good lawyers and so. One last. So I have to call him Mr. President, because oh. he's president of the uh, Dreamers Club. Hello, everyone. My name is Mehdi. I'm the president of the Dreamers Club. And um, earlier, you mentioned that um, part of your project is that you're looking for young advocates, and um, there's a fellowship program. And I was wondering what are the qualifications? Is it specifically for citizens, green card holders, or can undocumented and DACA recipients apply for the fellowship? That that will be, you know, will be the there'll be an announcement we hope at the end of January and that would be a good time to look into the mechanics of this but um, so once you see the announcement well I'll, I'll actually let Bettina know when there is an announcement and and then we can you know figure things out 